Evening, everybody. If you'd like to, turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 30. First Samuel chapter 30. Drew, I think you read this, was it two, three weeks ago? And so I was sitting there when he read it, and as he was reading it, it just jumped off the page. Um, so I just read it over and over, uh, and the gospel is so plain, and it's so clear. And this is just such a beautiful and powerful type of the Lord Jesus Christ, the greater David. Here's what I want to do tonight. Let's read it once through, get our bearings, find out what's going on, and then we'll go back and see if the Lord will bless us just to show us Christ in all this. I think we'd all be greatly blessed. So just pick up in verse 1, 1 Samuel chapter 30. It says, And it came to pass, when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south in Ziklag, and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire, and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away, and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. Now, I believe what I just read was probably my worst earthly fear. And it's probably the same for many of you. Maybe you go on a, a business trip or something like that, and you come back home, and you're driving through your city, and all of a sudden you just see the smoke pop up. And everything's burned to the ground, and you pull up in your driveway, and your house is burnt down, and everything you cherished, everything you loved, everything you held so dear, you put so much stock in, it's all gone. It's all been carried away. And that's the least of your concerns. That's the least of your problems, right? Your family, they've been taken, and you don't know by who. You just know it's an enemy. A brutal, cruel enemy is going to do terrible things to them just to get at you. And you imagine the wailing and the moaning and the crying these men th went through. This has been absolutely horrible. And this whole thing started about three chapters ago in chapter 27. You remember David, constantly pursued by Saul. Saul was jealous of him. So Saul's going after David time and time again, and every single time the Lord would deliver David out of Saul's hand. And once you get to chapter 27, something changes. David forgets, just like me, just like you. He forgets. He forgets that every single time the Lord had been faithful to deliver him out of Saul's hand, and he decides, I've had enough. I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to apply some logic here. I'm not going to seek the Lord or his will. I'm not going to inquire with him whatsoever. I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to sell out to the Philistines, Judah's enemy. I'll join up with them. Saul will stop following me. And so they take him. The Philistines take David in. They're like, yeah, sure, we'll take you. They even give him Ziklag, this little parcel of ground for him and his 600 men to dwell in. And after a while, they say, no, nah, we can't trust him. We got to do battle with Judah, and we don't know which way he's going to go in this battle. He's a liability. And they cut him off. And he comes back, and this is what he finds, that everything he loves, everything he cherished, everything he once put so much stock in is now gone. And if you think things can't get any worse, look down at verse 6. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. His own men had turned on him. They said, we're going to kill this guy. We're going to throw stones at him until he's dead. Why were they going to do that? Because David was to blame. He was the one who brought this on them. He was the one who did not inquire of the Lord. He was the one who went his own way. And for the first time, David is finding, this is all my fault. Everybody else knows it, and now David knows it as well. But look at the last couple words there in verse 6. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Even despite all this, even despite these dreadful circumstances that he had made for himself, everything he loved is gone. He has no idea where his family is. It says that this man right here encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And you know, if you're a believer, you can too. And I can too. I wish I'd learned that. No matter what the circumstances, 
As long as God is on His throne, as He rules in absolute sovereignty, and He is the first cause behind everything, which He is, as long as His mercies are new every single day to His people, which they are, as long as He looks for the reason to show that mercy, not in us, but in His Son, who is consistent, which He always does, as long as He continually brings good out of evil, which He always does, no matter what the circumstances, we have every reason to be encouraged, no matter what. Right here, just like David. Now, look over at verse 7. And David said to Abathar the priest, Elimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. It's the priest's garments, the garment of the intercessor, the breastplate. And Abathar brought hither the ephod to David, and David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. Now David finally does what he should have done in the first place. He inquires of the Lord. And he's not presumptuous. He says, Shall I pursue? He's like a caged lion. I want to go after them. Shall I pursue? Are you in this? And the Lord gives this promise, Without fail. David's a great type of Christ here. Without fail. You cannot fail. It's impossible for you to fail. Without fail. Everything you go to recover, you're going to recover every single bit of it. We're going to find out later and much, much more. Much, much more. Now go on. Keep on reading verses 9. So David went, he and 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Bezor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and 400 men, for 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Bezor. There's a bump in the road. David takes off with 600 men. The promise of God, you shall without fail recover everything. Nothing's going to be left behind. And they get to this little brook, tiny little river. And 200 of these men, they are so frail, they are so tired, they are so weak, they are so feeble, they can't ford the river. They can't cross. And they look at David and they say, David, we can't go on. You have to go. You go ahead. we got to stay here. And I need you to go recover everything for me because we can't continue on. Can you imagine those 400 that kept on riding? What did they have to say about those 200 as they were riding along? Cowards. Look at these guys. Their families are gone. We're going to recover our families. They can't be much of the strength to get over the little brook. What cowards? And that's going to play into our story later on. But look, we've got to go somewhere else. Look at verse 11. And they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread, and he did eat. And they made him drink water, and they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. And David said unto him, To who belongest thou, and whence art thou? He said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me, because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion upon the south of the Chethrites, and upon the coast which belongeth to Judah, and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God, that thou wilt neither kill me, nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. Now, I'd have you notice something there for just a second. What cruelty from the master to this servant? The master had absolutely no love for his servant. He told his servant after they took Ziklag, march, keep on marching. His servant said, I feel sick. I can't march along. He says, well, die. Just leave him here. All I care about is you meeting the expectation. The expectation is to march. If you can't march, just stay here and die. That master had absolutely no love for his servant. All he was cared about was whether his servant could meet the expectation or not. Vice versa, that servant had absolutely no love to his master. He told David, he said, listen, I'll take you anywhere you want to go. I'll show you anything you want to see. Just two things. Don't kill me and don't send me back to my master. But look at the mercy and the loving kindness of David in all this. David's riding through the wilderness. You don't find random people in the wilderness. He knows exactly who this boy is. This is part of the war party that just took his wives, that burned his city, that did all these terrible things to him. Would anyone have minded if David would have just kept on riding by? Not a bit. But he stops. He comes to that boy where he's at. 
gives him food, gives him water, revives him, makes him confess what he's done. And the strangest thing, he sets him free. Now, look at verse 16. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth. These are the Amalekites, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And David smote them from the twilight, even unto the evening of the next day, and there escaped not a man of them, save four hundred young men, which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all, and David took all the flocks and the herds which they drave before those other cattle and said, This is David's spoil. David, not David and 400, David by himself recovered all. Not a thing was lost. And the choicest of the spoils go to who? The Davids. See, much more was gathered. The Amalekites had spoiled many nations. He went, he got everything back that they took from him, and he took everything from the Amalekites. All the choicest of the spoils go to David. Now, look at verse 21. And David came to the 200 men which were so faint that they could not follow David whom they made also to abide at the brook Bezor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. Can you imagine being one of these guys? David, I can't go. I need you to go recover everything for me. I'm too weak. I'm too feeble. And so all of a sudden, David comes back from the battle, and they see him coming over the hill. What are these guys saying? How's he going to treat us? Is he going to berate us? Is he going to put us to death? Probably the best we can hope for. Maybe get our wives and kids back and he'll just banish us and get rid of us. What's it going to be? And he rides through. All these men are absolutely terrified. And what does he do? He salutes them. He shows them respect. Respect for the feeble. Go on reading. Verse 22. Then answered all the wicked men and men of Belial. These are the 400 of those that went with David and said, because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered. Save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. Then said David, You shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff, they shall part alike. And it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. What are these 400 men so mad about? Well, they hate grace. They said, we fought. We had the courage. We had the ability. We had the strength. We went. We recovered everything with you. We have power here. They shouldn't get the same thing that we get. You see, a man who believes himself to be powerful and capable and able he absolutely hates grace. You know who loves grace? A whole bunch of weak folks who couldn't ford the river, who needed David to recover everything for them. Now, the question, where's the gospel in all that? The story begins with David's home, Ziklag. He comes home and has been destroyed, burned to the ground. Everything he loved was cherished he cherished, was taken away, carried away. And it's not so much that it was taken, but who took it? It was the Amalekites. The Amalekites, who do they represent? They represent the flesh. That old man, that old, wicked, sinful nature that each and every man is born with when he enters into this world. That same flesh that is mentioned in Galatians 5.17, it says, For the flesh lusteth, warreth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Every believer knows something about that. That old, wicked man warring with that new, holy man inside of you. And I find this very interesting. When did the Amalekites attack? Did you catch it? It's in the first verse. The third day. 
It was on the third day that the Amalekites attacked. What's the significance? The resurrection. Our Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth. He bore the sins of God's elect in his body. He died under the wrath of God. He was put down in that tomb. And three days later, he came out of that tomb. His father resurrected him from the dead, and he resurrected himself from the dead. The question is why? Because he did exactly what he came to do. He put away all the sins of everybody he came back here to redeem. And you know what? That is the hope of every single believer, the resurrected Christ. Our hope is this, that he bore my sins in his body, that he kept the law for me. He died under the wrath of God, and God raised him from the dead because he was successful in what he did. I have absolutely nothing else but that. That resurrected Christ is everything. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, chiefly this, that is the very evidence that there is a new man inside of you. A holy man, a man who does not sin, a man who believes God, a man who loves God, a perfect man, the very Spirit of God dwelling in you. And as soon as he's there, you know what happens? The flesh attacks. They go on the offensive, and there is a war where the flesh lusts against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh, and you cannot do what you want to do. What does that look like? Turn over to Romans chapter 7. I think Todd read this not too long ago, but if I had to put a name to this verse of Scripture here, I'd call it home because it feels like home. Romans 7, look at verse 17. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that is good. Me and the law agree, I'm guilty. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me, that sinful nature. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that do I. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. I'm willing, I want to to never sin again, to love the Lord with all my heart and all my soul and all my spirit, my neighbor as myself, all those things, to believe God perfectly, to never fret, to never worry ever again and just trust Him every single day and every moment, I don't find it. I would never have an evil motive again. I will never have an evil suspicion again. I would have all these things, but I can't stop. I can't stop sinning, and that's the war, folks. A natural man doesn't experience that because there's nobody to fight with. It's just the old man being the old man. But as soon as that new man is given, that new man who looks to that resurrected Christ and him alone, that's when the war begins. And so you're in this, I don't know what we call it, spiritually melancholy state, always completely and utterly satisfied in Christ, satisfied to be saved by him and his blood and his grace alone, and never once satisfied with yourself. As Todd always says, what is that? That is the healthy state of every believer. But in this state, when this new man is given, you see things, things that you could not see before, the same exact two things that David saw when he came back to Ziklag. What do you see? Well, he came home and everything he loved and everything he cherished and everything he put so much stock in before was now burned to the ground and carried away. It was gone. You know that about your works, don't you? And so do I. Those things that he's put stock in, he used to think they were so good, my best attempts, my best thoughts, my best actions, whatever they may be, those things we put so much value on, when you have these new eyes and you have this new man, you see it's all burned to the ground, it's nothing, it's all been carried away, it's just sin, just iniquity, other sins that have to be atoned for. And here's the second thing David saw when he got there. This was all his fault. 
These men over here, they're going to stone me because they blame me, and rightfully so. I am in this situation because it's my fault. I brought this on myself. The great scapegoat of the natural man when he is confronted with the true and living God, the sovereignty of God. But he is no scapegoat for the believer. I did this to myself. I did what I wanted to do. And I suffered the consequences. But in the midst of all this, what did David do? David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. What encouragement is there in all this? Well, here's the encouragement. What happened at Bezor? Over at Bezor, these 200 men said, David, we can't recover. We can't go on. We're too feeble. We're too weak. We can't go. We need you to go for us. Leave us behind, and you go for us, and you recover everything we lost. And David comes back, having recovered everything for these men. And how did he treat them? With a salute. With respect. I remember a story about that. Two boys, two young men, two brothers. They approached on the Lord seeking acceptance. One, Cain, a farmer. He goes to the altar. He brings his best, best fruits, best vegetables. He brings the best he can muster. And he says, this is my acceptance. Accept me because I brought this, because I did this. I grew this. And it says, unto Cain and his offering, the Lord had not respect. Works are nothing. Another brother steps up, Abel. And he comes with nothing but a slain lamb alone. What is he saying? I am so sinful. I am so unable. My only hope is that Christ died for me, that he is my eternally slain lamb. I have nothing else but this. This is the only thing I can offer, what you offered. Christ and him crucified, it's all I have. And you know what? The Father saluted him. Unto Abel in his offering, God had respect. This is the encouragement, folks, right here. God loves sinners. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That's the encouragement of the gospel right there, that Christ came. Sinners is who he saved. If you fit that mold, you're one for whom he saved. Now, The religion of this world is wrong. They will tell you there is something you need to do. Something you need to do to earn salvation. That it's a toss-up that is based on your decision in some way. But our story actually tells the true tale, salvation story, if you will. Go back to your text. I want you to look at verse 7. This is the true tale. 1 Samuel 30, verse 7, says, And David said to Abathar the priest, Elimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abathar brought hither the ephod to David, and David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recovered all. You know what's illustrating? The covenant of grace. That covenant happened between the Father and the Son before the world ever Began where Christ became the surety of his people, where Christ became the intercessor of his people. David called for the ephod, the priestly garments, the garments of the intercessor, the breastplate of the intercessor. He says, I want to pursue. Shall I pursue? And he said, you shall pursue and you shall recover all. I love it. And the scripture poses this and illustrates the covenant of grace in several different ways. Sometimes as the father being the initiator. And sometimes as the son being the initiator. Well, in effect, there is no initiator because God is God. But yet I love these illustrations where Christ is the initiator. Just sitting there like a caged lion. Father, you give me the word and I will pursue after every one of your people. Just because I love them. Just because I want to do your will. You give me the word and I will pursue and I will recover every single one of them. I won't leave any of them without being recovered. I'm going to deliver them all back to you without a scratch on them. And the Father says, go. Unleashed that line. You shall without fail, because Christ can't fail, because God can't fail. Whatever he sets out to do, he does. 
and he did, and it's over. And there's a, I guess, an illustrating commentary on this in Isaiah. Turn over to Isaiah chapter 59. You may enjoy reading this. Isaiah 59, and pick up in verse 15. It says, Yea, truth faileth. That's absolutely true. Amongst men, we got no love for the truth. Truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. There was no justice. There was no justifier. And he saw that there was no man. And wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him. And his righteousness, it sustained him. For he put on the righteousness as a breastplate. And an helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. And he was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries. Recompense to his enemies. To the islands he will repay recompense. Now I love this. The language here illustrates the Lord's love and heroism towards his people. And it says this. It says he looked down and he saw no man. And that's not that the Lord was reacting to the fall. It caught him off guard. And he looked down and saw that there was no man. No, this is language that shows his heroism. He looked down at his people. He saw no man. No one can keep the law. They can't do anything about their circumstances. He wondered that there was no intercessor. There is no man to be the effective intercessor between God and them. There is no one. And he saw no man, and he found no intercessor. He wondered at it, and so he became the intercessor. He became a man. He came to this earth. He became the great high priest for God's people, bridging that gap between the Father and his people. And I love this. He put on the ephod, the breastplate, became the great high priest. He put on the helmet of salvation, that helmet that takes the blows so that we don't have to. His righteousness it sustained him and sustains every one of his people. And the end part is what's so intriguing. Everybody gets recompensed. His adversaries, his enemies, they get recompensed. They get exactly what they deserve. But also, too, his people. I wouldn't say this if this wasn't the teaching of Scripture. Because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us, we're going to get exactly what we deserve. And it's all good. We will have the very inheritance of the Lord Jesus Christ. In this generation, you know what nobody wants to talk about in man's religion? The justness and justice of God. Nobody wants to talk about that. It's a terrifying thought, and you put it in the parameters of their religion. A God who must punish sin, a God who must have perfect equity and perfect holiness. No, nobody wants to talk about him. But don't we love that? Don't we love the just God? Because that means if my sins have been paid for and they have been put away, the Father must receive me in Christ because his very justice demands us. That just God this world hates, that's our hope. That he's good to his word, that he is good to his just character. And because my sin's been taken away, I'll be received as a son. Go back to your text. Look at verse 16. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing, because all of the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And David smote, don't miss that word, them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them, save four hundred young men, which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives, and there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that had taken to them. David recovered all. David recovered everything they had lost, and he did it through smiting. I'll read you this, Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. 
But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are presently healed. See, David recovered all. Christ recovered all. And it was through smiting. He smote himself. He bore our sins in his body and he smote himself that we might not be smitten. That we presently, everybody in him, have been healed. And I love this. Verse 20. And David took all the flocks and the herds which they drave before those other cattle and said, This is David's spoil. Christ gets all the spoil. He gets all the glory in salvation. He got full acceptance from his father when he came back into heaven. His father received him as that conquering hero. Full love from his father. Full admiration. Full reception. And the father gave him all things. All the rule and reign was put into his hand. The choicest spoils. All the spoil goes to Christ. But look what David did with these spoils. Look at verse 26. And when David came to Ziklag, he sent of the spoil unto the elders of Judah, even to his friends, saying, Behold, a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. David took all these spoils, the choicest spoils, the spoils he had earned through his great victory. And what did he do? He gave it to all his friends. He's talking about union with Christ. Everything Christ has. Everything he accomplished, we have too. We have his war spoils because of our union with him. Everything. Christ gets all the glory. Listen to this. Romans 8, 29 and 30. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Not will glorify. Glorified. That's presently, right now. We have absolutely no experience of that whatsoever. But one day when this flesh is gone and there's just the new man, we will see we're glorified in Christ. He shares his war spoils. Acceptance. This is what Ephesians 1, 6 says. He hath made us accepted. In who? In the beloved. That same acceptance the Father receives the Son with. He receives all his people because we are in him. Rule and reign. Revelation 1 6, and he hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. What does that mean? I don't know. I don't know what that's going to be like. I know I have absolutely no experience of it right now. He shares all his war spoils. And then finally, this this is the greatest spoil of them all. Psalm 17, 15, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Everything he has, everything he is, his righteousness, his sanctification, everything he has, we have to in him that this scripture might be fulfilled. Look down to verse 24. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. David went. Christ went. He recovered all. He did all the war fighting. He took care of everything. We tarried by the stuff. And we get the exact same thing because we were in him the entire time. That's how real union with Christ actually is is he who goes off to the battle and he who tarries by the stuff they get the exact same thing now if you're a believer and this resurrected Christ is your only hope you have this you have this great salvation you have this great savior and you have it by this thing we call grace and I think that in our story one of the most beautiful types and illustrations of grace we find right here, and it's in that Egyptian boy that David found along the way. Remember we were talking about him? His master was an Amalekite, and his master had no love for that servant. The Amalekite master said, march. The servant said, I can't. I can't continue on. I've fallen ill. He's an Egyptian. Bondage. I can't continue on. The master said, I don't care. 
All I'm interested in is whether you meet the expectation or not, and the expectation is to march. I can't then die. I would never, ever disrespect God's holy law in any way. It is beautiful. It is wonderful. It expresses the justness and the justice and the righteousness of God. But folks, the law doesn't care. All the law cares about is whether you meet the mark or not. The expectation is perfection. Have you kept me or have you not? And since no man can keep the law in any way, shape, or form, it has one job, one rule, and that's it, to declare guilt. Don't come by way of the law. The law doesn't care. And you know what the law can never produce? Love. The master had absolutely no love for the servant, but the servant had no love for, ma for the master. He told David, I'll take you anywhere you want to go. Just don't kill me and don't send me back to my master. Todd's been saying that a couple years. The law can never produce love. I never understood it until I read this. It'll just produce resentment. That's it, because no man can keep the law. But this is what produces love. Love in that heart, that new man, what David did for this boy right here. David rides by, and he knows he's no fool. He knows that this boy he finds down half dead in the ditch, that's part of the war party. He's one of the ones that just raided his city and took his family away. He knows exactly who this boy is, and he comes to him where he's at. And he revives him. He gives him food, and he gives him water, and he makes him confess what he's done. Yeah, I raided your village. I took your stuff. I took your family. I set your house on fire. And then he let him go. And folks, that's grace. That's what he's done for every one of his people. We're all God-haters by nature. We all would have killed the Lord Jesus Christ if we would have got the chance. We did it in our heart. But yet he comes to us where we're at, dead in that ditch, revives us, gives us life, makes us confess what we've done, what you are, a sinner, and nothing more. Here's the deal. Your debts are paid. You're free. Go. Go. Go do whatever it is you want to do. I don't hold anything against you. No one else holds anything against you. You're all paid up and free. You're free. Go do what you want to do. That's grace. And you know what? Had he just rode by, knowing that this boy was part and parcel to the burning of his village and the taking away of his family, if he just rode by and not done anything for him, does anybody have a problem with that? Anybody would have had a problem with it if he were stuck a sword in his back while he's riding along? I don't. Just attacked his village, just took his family. What's wrong with him just riding by? Absolutely nothing. No one should ever have a problem with election, though. Election is this. Grace is this. The love of God is this. He comes to that enemy dead in the ditch. He feeds him. He gives him water. He revives him. He makes him confess what he's done, and then he sets him free. And he did that to Bartimaeus. Go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. You can see. You have everything you need. Do whatever it is you want. You don't owe anybody anything. You're healed. What did he do? It says he followed Jesus in the way. When he does that for a man, when he comes to him where he's at, and he revives him, he gives his grace to him. This is what that man does for the rest of his days. He follows him. He just keeps on looking to him for the rest of his life. This battle with them Amalekites, this flesh, what does a win look like? Well, it's pretty simple. My very last dying breath, I die looking to that resurrected Christ and to him alone. That's it. And folks, we all will. Every elect child of God will persevere to the very end because we've been preserved by this great God. I hope you got something out of that. I'm going to leave you there. Mm -hmm.